Wherever in the world you are located, you probably have seen Rowan yarn in one of your local yarn stores or seen multiple publications by Rowan. Rowan started in the late 1970s, and since then it produced multiple publications, new yarns, beautiful designs, and created really a worldwide knitting community. In this series, you're going to meet people who work at Rowan or with Rowan. You're going to meet people in the headquarters. You're going to meet different designers and store owners who work with Rowan. And you're going to get the sense of what makes this company so successful. I hope you enjoyed this series. And my very first guest today is going to be David McLeod, a brand manager for Rowan. Hi, David. Welcome to my channel. Hello, Irina. <laughs> well, I want to talk about all the yarns that Rowan creates. And there is such okay. a vast variety. And there is different yarns. There is core yarns. And then there is some seasonal favorites. But before we start talking about that, I wanted my viewers to learn a little bit more about you personally. Oh, but I've heard... <laughs> That you grew up on the farm and you were shearing sheep and like that was your life growing up. Yeah, yeah. Oh. It's a bit of a strange thing for me because I am, I'm, as my name suggests, I'm Scottish and um, I'm from a farming family. My brother's a farmer and my brother-in-law are still farming. Um, I did grow up in on a farm, so my summers were spent at the sheep shearing and looking after sheep and clipping and so what I say now is that I'm actually closing the loop because they farm, but I get it and sell it. So it's I'm still at closing that loop. So, yeah, it's a bit of a weird journey for me to come to Rowan because I'd studied graphic design. I worked in newspaper for years and then I've come back to um, fiber and development and kind of which is a bit back to my childhood again. So, yeah, interesting right. journey around. And what I appreciate about your story, and this is not the first time I hear it, that there is the promotion within Ron, that you can grow within yeah. Ron as an employee. So you started with graphic design, but now you are the brand manager, basically responsible for a lot of decisions. <laughs> yeah, totally. I've been with Ron 16 years, um, and there's still people with Ron that I've worked with all my working life here we've got people that have been here 25 years 26 plus and um, I came in as just a design room manager and I have progressed through and now I'm brand manager as you say but equally Lisa Richardson that I work with she came in as a temporary person just about the same time uh, same time I did and now she's our lead in-house designer right. um you know Georgia Farrell's a new designer for us that we supported through it so we do have a bit of a kind of um, ethos that we like to develop people and promote from within, yeah. Let's talk about your fiber journey like a little bit more because okay. you're not just shearing sheep, you were a knitter from the get-go, you were surrounded by knitters. Tell me oh, like knitting Yeah, stuff. all my life, all my life. I remember it all my life. My grandmother was a knitter, my mother knitted, my mother knitted school jumpers for us, that was... You know, there was four of us, so they we had to um, make do with what we had. So we had knitted jumpers for school. I loved them. Um, but I remember my grandmother knitting, my grandfather knitting as well on the croft in Scotland, because that was it was actually quite a male pastime at that point, and they would knit quite a lot of socks. Um, and, yeah, it just seems a bit of a natural step for me. I was of the generation that was taught in primary junior school to knit. Right. Um, as part of our sewing and making lessons and so forth. So obviously I learned and I went away from it for a bit because, you know, boys don't knit. Um, and then I came back to it when I joined Rowan again and just decided that if I was going to be leading a team like that, then I was going to be able to do it. And that's, and now I'm hooked and I basically have something on the needles or in the plan all the time. My mum is an avid knitter. She knits all the time and is always has something on the go, but she doesn't like sewing up. Oh, I've Whereas heard that, that you're doing it. This is <laughs> <Yeah>. your part. <laughs> I quite like it. I quite like that structural bit of putting stuff together and making it finished and neat. Um, so she quite often just sends me a parcel in the post and I have to sew it up and send it back to her. So, yeah. And I'm. it's interesting how you touched on that, that it used to be, 
a predominantly male mm. thing to need, right? And I think the Outlander sort of brought it back because they were showing how Jamie taught Claire how to knit. And that was like yeah. reality of it. Like men in the winter used to knit socks. And exactly. do you feel like now it's coming back to this acceptance that men do knit? Yeah, absolutely. Since I've been started around, we've definitely had a huge resurgence in men um, knitting and male designers and just kind of it being um, across the spectrum, anybody can do it. And it is viewed as quite a, a creative and green pastime because it's it's the ultimate slow fashion. Um, it's all, you know, most, especially in rowing because we're natural fiber, everything is kind of sustainably sourced and it's, you know, biodegradable if you want to call it that. But, and it's just, yeah, lots and lots. We've got really young guys getting in touch with us now that want more information about classes and about learning to knit because they just it's recognized now in educational circles as well as a kind of a really good um karma and that's what it does for me it just settles me down and clears my mind at the end of a busy day but also is really good for hand-eye coordination and for mathematics skills because basically that's what a knitting pattern is it's a mathematical written equation on how to make that garment so and it's, it's interesting that like every time I interview teachers, they if they teach the kids in their classes how to knit, they they complain that like this hand to uh, coordination is just like small movement yeah. coordination is just gone from this generation because they're all on iPad and they don't have those skills. So yeah, it's totally. like a very important point. Well, you important. mentioned slow fashion. And yet, Ron prides yourself for being fashion forward, right? How <laughs> yeah. does that balance? <laughs> well, it's two different things. Slow fashion basically means it's time in production and um, we don't produce anything really, really quickly and get it out to the market. I mean, basically, a season for us takes about 18 months. And that includes yarn development, design, and then bringing it out to the market. Um, we're fashion reflective, not fashion forward. By that, I mean that we do keep an eye on the catwalks and the fashion houses in Paris and Milan. But we kind of recognise that they lead a fashion that we will eventually see on a high street store. And kind of Rowan is reflective of that. We don't try to be at the cutting edge. Also, that kind of reflects the market that we're in. Um, People like interesting construction and interesting techniques, not necessarily a high fashion piece. So, yeah. Well, when you think about people who buy the magazine and people who buy your yarn and meet with it, we have this like stereotypical view of like a little grandma sitting in the rocking chair and knitting. Who in reality are your customers? Well, that is one of the stereotypes that drives me insane about, every, you know, because you see it on television and TV adverts. It's a granny that sits and knits. And that is so not how it is. It's a vibrant and um, inclusive community in lots and lots of ways. And lots of it's a really lovely community. I mean, you know this, Irina, just the people sharing and loving and passing on that technique is really lovely. And it's really not the older generation anymore. Rowan's core customer, I would say, is probably 35 plus. But then we have other brands in our stable at the DMC group, and they target the younger generation for knit. Um, and we have a knitting for all as part of Rowan as well. And they teach teenagers to knit in high school and so forth. So it covers the spectrum totally. Well, every country I visited, I saw Rowan in stores. Oh, good. <laughs> Like, like, I mean, I'm sure there are a few that you haven't covered yet, but yeah. you are worldwide spread, basically. Yeah, well, that's pretty much what I say. We are a truly global yarn company. We're probably really the only one, although there's lots of other people cover lots of areas. But we pretty much cover the world. If we're not there as ourselves, as Rowan, we have a distributor in that market. Um, and you can usually find us somewhere in that country. I mean, not just around the corner always, but we're around in the country somewhere, yeah. When you look at the economies of different parts of the world, you cannot compare some places to others, right? Like there is economic growth in some places and mm. real poverty in others. Yeah, How exactly. do you decide what yarns you're going to manufacture to like cover all the possibilities, basically? 
So we cover a range of yarn in what we do in that we look at the fibre that we put in and um, whether that's a luxury fibre or a premium fibre or down to um, a sustainable fibre and so forth. And we cover a range of price within Rowan. I mean, we are a premium brand. There's no getting away from it. That's what we do. And that's what we do well. You know, it's part of my joy that I get to source these beautiful fibres and talk to spinners and developers around the world about their fiber in particular and then what they do to it but we do run from um you know that mid bottom range right up into uh, our pure cashmere is is probably our top price yarn but that is just beautiful it's closed sourcing it's done with um todd and duncan at loch leven in scotland who produce the best cashmere you know, it's and back home for you, right? Like, yeah, well, basic. <laughs> my grandmother's house was just along the road from them. So, so, yeah, it is, it's home for me. But kind of also it's we like to be sure that what we're bringing in has a story and it has a quality level. So when we're talking about a new yarn for Owen, I do spend quite a bit of time talking to them about, right, where are you? Where's that fibre coming from? What do you do? What happens in the spin process? As part, you know, my generation and my growing up is part of that farm and that community. I really like to make sure that everybody is treated fair in the process that we do to buy. And that includes the animals um, and the spinners and the farmers and the dye house. And, the, you know, I, it's the whole thing for me. It's not just buying it and selling it. I'm really invested in the actual product that we put out. Well, when I talk to my mom who used to knit back in her younger days and doesn't knit now, and she's watching my knitting journey in like total <laughs> amazement, basically. Yeah. She often asks me, she's like, well, when I knitted with wool, it was all itchy. Or when I knitted with cotton, it was all stretchy. And like I would knit it. And then after the first wash, you could not wear it anymore. Yeah. <laughs> in your opinion, like did the techniques of yarn production of manufacturing change or is it the way you source the yarn that this becomes not an issue oh it's a good question it's a bit of both in my opinion because um spinners and spin houses across the world have got really good at developing processes to make yarn beautiful and soft and also um it just got better at treating that precious fiber a bit better and that is really driven by the people that knit because everybody knits um now and they want to know the story where does that come from where do you get that and what animal is that from and how are they treated all those questions drive better quality in the product because it means people are going further and further back to find out what's going in the sourcing journey yeah so it's a bit of both but then also i would say that fiber is just treated better and it's better it's classified better than it used to be so, for instance, in our cottons, we now say it's an Egyptian cotton, but we can also put it down to the number, which basically refers to the year that that cotton was was um, originally grown. Um, and that means that your sourcing is unbelievably able to find out what that is. And then obviously, as that happens, you get better and better fiber because you know exactly what you're getting and the mixing and the categorization doesn't happen like it used to so you know you're, you're getting the pure best fiber in that cotton that you can possibly get and then that's the same with alpaca cashmere everything has got better and that is because the customer is just more educated to ask the proper questions now Right. And I like how it's very important to run as a company and how you really emphasize the importance of sourcing and traceability. And I know that you talked about South African mohair, which is like mm -hmm. one of the top sellers in raw yarns, that you're making sure that those animals are treated properly. Tell yeah. me a little bit like the backstory of that. So through pretty much all of our sourcing of fiber, we have some sort of certification these days um, and certification that people are treated properly. But particularly with the mohair, we source through the mohair, mohair Association South Africa. And basically they're an association that kind of does the bit that I just spoke about, but they do that on site in South Africa, if you like. They check the farms, they check the farmers, they spot check the animals, all that sort of stuff. And then they make sure that it comes to market as a true and proper product. And that's why we source through them. You can get mohair from South Africa that's not sourced through them, but obviously we make the decision that we're going to do that. And that's the prop the way that we source it through. 
Um, and it, I, like I said, for most um, natural fibers these days, there is all that in place. Um, and if there's not, there's people working very hard to bring it into place in the markets that are there. I have to say the developments and the um, leaps forwards that have been made just in the last five years about animal welfare and process treatment has just been great. It's been phenomenal. Well, when I look at the all the variety of the yarns that you produce, it's sort of like mind boggling because you yeah. can find something, as you mentioned, there is like super luxurious fibers and then there is something like you'll mix um, cotton with uh, alpaca to make it more yeah. affordable for people and strong. Yeah. Who makes that decision? Like, who decides <laughs> what percentage of wood fiber is going into that? Well, yeah, it's a kind of a bit of both. We we visit Italy, and to in Florence there is a big trade show, and everybody comes from the world, and they usually show um, at that show what they what they've developed over the year, um, and we the see spinners, that and we right. Have... So it's this different spinners. Uh... Yes, different spinners. Sorry, yeah, yeah, different. <laughs> been a company so we'll go and see what they've developed but my years in the business and the years of my colleagues we are very close with a lot of spin houses and I talk to them all the time um, and quite often what happens for Rowan is that we go back to them and go have you thought about trying this and putting that with this and we play a little bit and just kind of get that blend mix that we want so like our cotton cashmere that blended together that was worked with us and it actually has the handle of cashmere but like the lightness and coolness of cotton in there too and it's about playing with that percentage so you get the right handle and that's kind of a basic story of how we work with them you know they will come to us with new ideas for sure because we can't stay up to date with the technologicals of the, all the spinning that they're developing but i mean that really excites me too i get a bit geeky at that point it's a bit like our alpaca classic and um, that's a brand new spin technique that's been developed it's a tube and it's a cotton tube and then it's filled with air and the uh, the alpaca fiber is blown into it so it's then it's you get all the alpaca fiber but the lightness of the weight of a cotton yarn it's really it's amazing what they do now they have so many great techniques was there ever like a flop that you created some yarn? Oh. You thought it's going to be doing magnificently and then just like nobody buys it? Yeah, lots, but I'm not telling you any names. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do then? Like when something like this happened, what do you do about it? We, we just have to clear it through. We have to sell it through and let it go. Um, it's mainly stuff. Um, we haven't had masses to say because usually we do we do a lot of testing up front. But um, we've had some yarns that really just haven't worked um, in garment form. They just became really heavy in a full garment and then it drops and it comes a slippy stitch and it just doesn't work. Whereas, um, you know, the stuff that's there for a long time, like our felted tweed that's behind me or big wool or kids, kids silk haze or whatever, they are just going to be around forever because they're tried and tested and people return to them again and again. Right. Well, when you talk about like, kids silk haze right we're talking like over 80 shades there yeah 81 how, <laughs> <laughs> how does that change like over the years like do you add colors do you take the retire colors how does that yeah we, exactly all palettes are looked at every season we don't change every color palette every season because that's just too much and you know it's you know retailers need to have it in their stores and stuff but it goes through cycles and we add stuff in and we obviously have trend colors coming through. So autumn, winter, I think you can probably see there's a little bright trend coming through. As you can see, there's a bright trend. So we then refresh palettes and put brights in there. And um, spring, summer for next year, we've got a bright coming in as well. And, you know, there is always this prediction of color um on the fashion so may i think next autumn winter 24 they're predicting green and shades of green will be the trend color. they're not gonna that, tell anybody they're gonna yeah no i have just said that so I cast my, i've said it now so if it doesn't happen then i look silly but um yeah and that's part of what we do is we have trend prediction services and they come and they tell us what that color what the color might be or what they think is going to be and that's pulled from a number of places and lots of different trends so for example when disney released their um 
sleeping uh, bell movie she uh what's it called beauty and the beast beauty and the beast that's the one she's got a golden dress on for a lot of it that predicted a massive trend to come through that this golden color was going to come through and it did and um, at the moment, I mean, I don't know when people are watching this, but obviously Barbie movie is everywhere. So there is a huge trend predicted for pink. <laughs> it is literally that simple. And once the trend has started, it's, it follows through usually. Well, you mentioned that it takes 18 months to develop, like to publish a magazine or to develop a new yarn. How fast are these trends moving? Like, are you, that's why you're looking forward toward like the yeah. of 2024? Yeah, so we're currently, at the moment, we are designing and selecting for autumn, winter 2024. We are photographing spring, summer 2024, and we're about to launch autumn, winter 2023 to the market. That's what's happening. These garments behind me are from autumn, winter 2023 from the main magazine. And um, so we do usually find the trends are yearly and cyclical, but they don't... Um, reinvent themselves all the time kind of one leads on to another so like you know if it, there's a maroon trend and you'll usually find there's a warm trend follows that so it's a red coming through and an autumnal trend it all follows through so it's not it's we don't you can't throw everything out and start again every season so it, they do last quite a long time but generally a trend prediction is about 12 months ahead um and then it obviously it can go anyway sometimes they trend predict and it just doesn't happen at all so well let's talk about the balance of new yarns and your core yarns because mm. you have your core collection right that stays there for years yeah then there are some yarns that you either trying or they are more seasonal tell yeah. me a little bit about this process like how much freedom do you have to introduce new yarn and how oh. to decide on it well, we don't get complete freedom to with um, new yarn. If we want something particularly, then, you know, and we've got a space from it, um, we will go and look to fill that space or if there's a trend coming through. Because we are fed back from all our markets. I get lots of feedback from all over the world um, about what they think and what's missing and what the latest knit trend is and so forth. Um, but as you say, we have a core range and that is pretty static well, static's not the right word. It does change, the color palettes change, and we might bring in a color effect on a yarn, like we brought in felted tweed color, and that was a color change on the felted tweed palette. Um, and we'll obviously, as you said, bring in new shades every season. And then we do add yarns in, we add yarns in for excitement, just a little bit of excitement here and there, and some fun things. Like we had patina a few years ago that was a yarn that had a little um sparkle <laughs> through it yeah and that's not normally something that you would see within rowing because we are uh, predominantly natural fiber based but well, on that occasion we took in uh, obviously man-made fiber to add the sparkle in there and it's just a little bit of excitement that we add in we try pretty much to stay at our core because obviously that is what um the customers know and the knitters love and everybody returns to so we just try and make sure that we do interesting design and interesting support for those yarns um but we do like that little bit of excitement when we find it yeah <laughs> well when it comes to designs what's what what comes first right the chicken or the egg is it you have a yarn and you want designers to work with that yarn because you want to push that yarn to the customers or is it design based and then you figure out what yarn would work best with that design? Yeah. Um, again, it's a bit of both because we do, obviously we develop new yarn and the designers don't know that we're looking at a new yarn. So we have to then take that yarn to them and, and, and say, let's think about what is the best way to use that yarn? What's the best knit technique? Because obviously some yarns are great for just that bulky knit and that fluffy knit, but then you have other yarns that take texture very well and show cables very well and things like that. So th that does lead the design in that way. But then we have it the totally other way is that we have some of our designers coming to us saying, I really think this is a really big idea. I've worked on this. I really like this structural scarf, this sequence knitting. Can we do something in that? And then that's we sit down and we talk together about 
which yarn would be best for that, how we can bring that. Is that a, a book? Is that a digital pattern? Is that something that they do on our socials channels? You know, we have a lot. We So it comes at us both ways, if you like. Um, and there's not necessarily one way leading the direction apart from where we're going as a brand, if you know what I mean. <laughs> well, again, like when I, I mentioned to you that like every time I travel, I'll go to a yarn store like anywhere in the world and I'll find some Rowan there. So when people think of Rowan as a brand, they just think of this like faceless monstrosity that <laughs> you don't know who is making decisions, who is ruling, who is making the choices, who is responsible for those decisions. Well, there's lots of decisions made and a lot of it is made in the team because we really are a, quite a small team for a big global brand and we work really closely together. But I'm brand manager, so anything that's touched with Rowan touches me at some point usually. We have a marketing manager that works, Lindsay, who's been with the company 25 years and kind of she has a lot of input into what our marketing looks like outside. But then I have a boss. Sharon Brandt and she's brand director and kind of and she we work together closely and we talk about where the brand's going and the direction and um but I don't there's not really a buck stop person that makes the decision for the brand I mean if I had I guess it is Sharon because she's the brand director and that's her role but she does you know involve a lot of people in those discussions and those um decisions and we there is a lot of talking before we make big decisions and um, presentations and thinking of design ideas and so forth. So, both you and Sharon are incredible knitters. <laughs> Thank Sharon, you. Sharon used to work in the movie industry and create. Yeah, she did. Yeah. Where for Sharon's a much better knitter than I am. I freely admit that. <laughs> How does the fact that you are knitters influence the decision making for the for the company? Oh, massively and massively for the brand, because obviously um, I don't, I really don't think you could do this job if you didn't have a knowledge about that step, because it's not just turning out product. You have to be able to work and talk in that world and talk to knitters and know what they want and know how they do and also know what they want to see in a store, how that works, what they're going to purchase. Every single yarn that goes out, I have knitted with it. That was one deal I made when I started. I'm not going to stand behind a product unless I've knitted with it and I believe in it. And that's kind of where I am. And, you know, Sharon's the same. Every new thing, it goes, gets sent to her and she knits it too. So we stand there because we've done it and we know that and we can say, oh, maybe don't do that. Try this. Do, use a cable stitch or, you know, twist twist your fair aisle so you don't get the holes. Or And we just because we're there and we know that. And that means that we know we're working at the, top end of the brand but we're also working at the coal face if you like and actually making sure that what we put out works every time you're dealing with customers there is this rewarding experience of like yeah. people loving your product but then there is like gonna be one or two lemons that gonna just make your life miserable <laughs> what's the most difficult thing about being a brand manager oh um the the most difficult thing there are a few things that are difficult is kind of managing the brand within a company you have to be a bit of a politician but that's the same for everybody um the kind of way that it all works and it kind of moves through and just the normal business day dealings that can be difficult too um we have really really loyal customers but and they love us and they tell us and that is very rewarding and i'm very pleased to meet people but equally they kind of uh, they can tell us if we do something they don't like they really tell us too um that's their prerogative <laughs> they're allowed to do that uh the difficult thing for me is basically maybe social media people the keyboard warrior people forget there are um there's people behind that statement and that presence and that knit or that design um, and it's just, it's nice to be nice. Just be kind, guys. That's all I'd say. Make, make your point by all means, but be nice. That's, and that's the difficult bit because I'm a real people person. I love to meet people and I love to talk, but I love my team and they're very loyal. So I will look after them as, as best I can. Well, you've been doing it for over a decade. It's like, it's, it's <laughs> yeah. a while. 
Do you have a favorite yarn that you ever oh. create? <laughs> Or is that like picking a favorite child? No, I can tell you my favorite yarn hands down is Soft Jack DK. I am not ashamed of that. I absolutely love it. It's basically a chainette construction, which means it's like a like a chain that's been put together. And what that means is you can knit with it and there is a little bit of movement in it, in the yarn itself. So your stitch relaxes back into it's the fabric. So if you're maybe not the best knitter in the world, which I never can, said I was, um, it, it means that it relaxes back into it and your knitting fabric looks beautiful and neat. Also, Yak is an amazing fibre, really, really mind-blowingly good, just kind of, you know, water resistant, heat resistant. And you think about where Yaks live and breathe, then they have to um, cope with extremes of temperature and extremes of weather. And of course, then their natural fiber deals with that too. And it washes and wears. I've got loads of it in my wardrobe and I just wear it again and again and again. And it's really warm in winter and cool in summer. I cannot, it just ticks all the boxes for me, Soft Jack DK. I am slightly biased because it is one of my developments. So. <laughs> no, and I, 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 I love it as well. And I love it because it also, because of the chain construction, it also like if you use it in cables, it gives mm. this, like, a little extra puffiness to the cables. Yeah, exactly. They never like become flat. So I love yeah. that as well. Like a little yeah, extra thing. Well, when you talk about yak and development of that uh, yarn, uh you mentioned somewhere that like it's it's sustainable tell yeah. me about that part like how did you source that specific fiber so it's actually yak was around it was a bit of a trend in the knit world like maybe ooh, i don't know five years ago something like that and the fiber like there is always a little trend at the minute it's alpaca everybody's showing you alpaca fiber um yak was around for a while and people were showing me it and i thought why is this suddenly appeared so i just did my own research went off um and looked up yak and kind of spent some time talking to my contacts and about where the yak comes from and why and um, why we're seeing it now and it was because just the freedom opened up in the world and yak fiber could get out of where it is done it's um it is grown or oh, i'd say the yaks are reared worked farmed all over the world but a lot of it comes from um, mongolia and actually that coming out being able to get the fiber out into the market was the big trick for us it is sustainably sourced because um the yak farms have been there as long um as time has happened and it's actually it, they don't take the full fur off the yak they take sections of it where it's softer so it, and it just grows back um and obviously that it they don't harm the yak in the way that that do that it's a byproduct of yak as well and it kind of makes sense to just use something that's there and um, it we found it through one of our suppliers when i started talking to them they said oh yeah we've got this yak and we're planning to do this and so i was like well i don't don't show it to anybody else i want to see what you're doing and that's basically i went to see it we looked at it they had about three or four different constructions and we played around a little bit just kind of making sure that we weren't um taking out too much yak still having enough yak to get that fiber but keeping the lightness and the construction so it worked the right way and that's the fun bit for me is playing with that fiber to get a product that we like in the end. What do you dream of? Like when you sleep, is it like all mixing different fibers and blowing the cotton to blow out? <laughs> <pocket? Like> well, <laughs> it's lots and lots of things. Um, it's also the thing of maybe the other one thing that is difficult about being brand manager around. I'm never off duty um, because I can be walking um out with the dogs and I just think oh look at the color of those trees or I'm um, really or if I visit somewhere at the weekend I think oh wow there's a Rowan photo shoot here or something like that I'm always kind of in part of my Rowan brains going on um I do tend to at uh, home life um especially if I'm out shopping and I'm in a clothes shop I look at and I think oh what's that made of you can usually find me rummaging through something on a coat hanger to look at the label to find out what the fiber is and how it's constructed um yeah or holding something up and taking a picture in a store I get very strange because I I go 
all stores, I don't care who they're selling to, I will go and look. And it's because then I look at the construction of that garment, how that's been to put together, how it's sewn together. And kind of, so I think, could that work in knit and then take that idea through to a designer and kind of go, look what I saw, how could we do that, that sort of thing. And it's all, I honestly, you're just never off duty. My brain is always thinking partly of Rowan. So um, I don't dream of fibre, like you said. Uh, um, I am a bit of a fibre geek and I do get lost in the benefits of natural fibre at, um, at some point. But yeah, I don't dream of fibre. <laughs> do you have a favourite knitting technique? Because like I know you said that you love the felted tweed and it's like perfect for all the colour work. and Yeah. Um, <laughs> their favourite, <laughs> of course. Well, big admission here from Rowan, which is known for its colour work. I'm not a great colour work netter. That's not my thing. I quite like one colour. I love a cable. I love texture. Um, I'm a huge fan of Martin Story Knits. Um, you know, everybody knows him. And I have to say, he's such a gentleman to work with. He's such a lovely man. But I quite like that um, texture knitting and that construction knit. So then figuring out that that cable stitch is going to do that. And, fig you know, I'm quite a technical knit sort of person in that sort of way. Um, and I like sewing up, like I said, making it neat and making it nice and tidy in the end is pleases me greatly. Does knitting ever stress you out? Oh, yeah, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I have the joys of both sides of it because I did say it's my calm down, which is the act of physically me knitting is my calm down. But then obviously we have all the knitting that goes on here. I have to... Uh, kind of help my team arrange the knitting to come back in time for the photo shoots we have knitters around the world and um we have to deal with their problems and um their issues that they've had we have our test knitters and obviously we have something like 75 of them around the uk that knit for us and knit our test garments and then obviously they become our extended family so you get to know a bit about their personal life and um yeah so that sort of that's when knitting stresses me out trying to make sure that it meets all the deadlines and we're are ready to do everything we need to do but then it's also my calm down as well and all my family in it so it's a bit of an ongoing conversation that we have as a family about what we're knitting and what we're doing so do you ever cheat on raw and then knit with somebody else's yarn no <laughs> I have been asked to test knit other yarns um, within the group, and I've done that, but I have never cheated on Rowan. I just don't, I'm not, you can say what you like, I just don't think it's worth it. I'm, it's not, I am not an acrylic knitter. That's not go ever going to be me, even if I don't work for Rowan. <laughs> but do you feel like Rowan covers like every need of every knitter out there, like the range of the yarns that you provide? Yeah, um, I think we pretty much have a really good base. Um, it's it's difficult sometimes when people are allergic to wool or can't knit with that loose fiber. It's kind of hard to say that what would be then work for them within Rowan. I mean, we do have the hypogelic hypoallergenic yarns, so soft jack is hypoallergenic, and um, but we have the really lovely cottons as well that are soft and brushed, so they can replace it. But it's kind of if if you're allergic to that natural fiber in some way, it's really hard to find you a replacement within Rowan. But they they are there. But then um, you don't you can't have the tweed effects or things like that because it's usually one fiber. When I look at the Rowan's magazine, it's like it's very what's the word I'm looking for? Like theatrical, you know. There's yeah. this whole staging of the presentation of um, yeah. it's like fairy tale sort of story. Yeah telling thank you do you think about that like do, when you see places do you think immediately like oh it's this would be like yeah. a setting for the photo shoot all the time my phone is full of pictures of places i've visited or friends or colleagues have sent me pictures saying there's a rowan shoot here and they send me a couple of images and um, and it's quite interesting that we have we think about lots of the places in the uk that we can do it as well and try and get interesting places but stuff places that are predominantly british and talk about british because that's what we are we're a british yarn brand um uh, playing on the global market and our customers really like the um 
Britishness than when we do the big, you know, old country houses and stuff like that. They really love all that, the big theatricals of the yarn brand. Yeah, so I have my phone is full of strange images of um, houses or beaches or things like that, and it's people. But it's quite hard to find a good location because they they have to do a lot of things for us. They have to give us enough options. So usually in those big stories, we can have 19, 20 pieces and we have to have different backgrounds for each one. Also, they have to uh, allow us to have enough light because we are a natural light brand. We don't usually don't light, especially when we're outside, we don't light um, shots. Um, also, it has to be... Um, we have to be able to get there. <laughs> so, you know, there's some beautiful places in the north of Scotland, but it, it's just a nightmare to get up there. And also, you've got to be guaranteed some sort of lightness and weather to get turn up and do it. So, <laughs> I mean, has that ever been a issue, like, of you getting to the set and it's just, like, nasty weather and you can't shoot? Yeah. It, thankfully, it doesn't happen as often as you would think. We have had to call shoots in the past and just go, that's it, we're stopping it because we can't carry on in this. Um, although most of the time, the team are so great that they can spin on a wheel and think, okay, we'll go inside and we'll shoot it in here. Or We did have um, one shoot planned um, when we were in the old mill in Homefirth, which is in the Yorkshire Valleys. And that was where it originally started. And everybody turned up and then it started to snow. And it really got heavy, really, really heavy. And if anybody knows Home Firth, it's up hills and down. You know, it's not it's not an easy place to get around. And we thought, oh, what are we going to do? And it stopped snowing, thankfully, but it was covered in snow everywhere. And the photographer just said, this is fantastic. We'll just do a snow shoot. And that's what we did. And nobody ever knew the problems that we had with that shoot because it was a beautiful snowy shoot that we had. Yeah, so, I think like the needs look spectacular in the snow. Yeah. So this every time yeah. there is a snow, I'm going outside with my meeting just to take. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, tell me a little bit about COVID because that couldn't have been easy for the company. Oh no, it wasn't. Um, it was kind of a strange thing because knitting and crafting, um, had a bit of a double-edged sword there because there was lots of people at home and they were crafting and um, our warehouse here was really busy we were shipping out all the time um because that's what happening and lots of our stores were doing uh, curbside pickups and things like that so because people were at home and wanting to craft and i think we had a big influx of people um either starting knitting or returning to it because yeah. they and just discovering that that actually was a great karma and but you know because covid caused a lot of anxiety for a lot of people and actually it just calmed it down again but actually physicality of actually working in a design team and working with a design team that we do was really difficult because there is only so much you can do remotely when you work in a for a brand and for an industry that is <clears throat> A lot of it is color based. You can't do that over a computer screen. You just need to be there to see it. And a lot of that kind of work and timing of um, pulling colors together, working together, working designs together. You have to have knit things physically knitted and you have to have them physically photographed. That was really difficult for us in COVID. But now, thankfully, it's all settled down again. And we seem to have um, retained quite a bit of new knitter fans so craft itself and did really well in that period although it was difficult for us as a team well it's also like your manufacturing probably was hindered as well, well because you had a lot uh, done in italy right and yeah absolutely it was Australia. terrible yeah they just with i mean obviously i've worked with a lot of them for a number of years so i was phoning to check they were okay and they just said it's just it, it shut down overnight it, and it was just gone and there was nothing we could do we didn't you know we weren't getting deliveries of stock but people were to, trying to buy more and more you know it was a very tricky situation to have to be in and yeah it it some of our suppliers in italy had a terrible terrible time it was really difficult right well <laughs> what's your relationship with zoom nowadays <laughs> <laughs> oh, zoom great thing and um, basically <clears throat> the team ran on zoom um, and my lots and lots of meetings happens on zoom now because we've got lots of 
just international stuff going on. I mean, I know we work on our Rowan Connect platform, which is a way that we talk digitally to the world about lots of interactions and things that we do. And a bit like yourself, I'm sure people recognize me because I do that uh, um, Zoom stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and when I was in um, road knitting in New York, I had people taking my photograph sneakily in the lift without my knowing and then posting it saying, oh, I was in a lift with Mr. Rowan. <laughs> and I find that all a bit strange that actually you become a face without even knowing that you are. <clears throat> um, yeah. So Zoom is a very strange thing. It, but it was also a good thing for me because it meant that I kept in touch with my family because I have family in Edinburgh and further down south in England. And, you know, so Zoom was a great thing for me. And it still is. I still use it almost every day. <laughs> well, you mentioned that, like, you personally, you ha- you communicate with people at the meals and then you're dealing with all the things within Rowan and then yeah. Rowan, the connect part of the Rowan. Yeah. It's, like, how did that change your life that suddenly, like, you know, all these people, they're all in your life? Yeah, it would. Well, Connect was a very strange thing because it really kicked in in COVID and the lockdowns that we had because obviously people were hungry for that sort of um, connection and family and community. And that's what we offered. So <clears throat> literally overnight, we went from nothing to talking to 700 people from my dining room. It was just crazy. Absolutely mad. Um, and that's kind of... But we had so many lovely messages at that point as well. People just saying... Oh, thank you for doing this and thank you for keeping it going and talking and and now we've kept it up and we do lots we do presentations of our new season and lots of um workshops and classes and so forth and um, and we still get lovely messages because if we went to a show so like we went to Vogue Knitting in New York I can talk to a lot of people at that show but no way do they get an hour or half an hour like this with just me talking And lots of people can't travel to those shows. They're not able to do it, whether it's, you know, financial, family, disability, anything. I don't know what would stop. But we've had so many messages saying, thank you. I would never be able to do that. And now I feel like I can be part of that knitting community. And it's just, it's lovely. And it's something that we're definitely going to continue. We love the Rowan Connect, although um, it is strange that everybody knows what my dining room looks like. <laughs> <laughs> and I find it also like it's it helps people connect not only with you and not only with the designers but with each other. It creates yeah. this community yeah. because they go through the same knit along together. Like I know Martin now runs the knit along for his blanket for the for yeah. And you guys, if you don't, if you haven't seen it, you should join <laughs> Row and Connect and just like see all the events that. Yeah, we're they- launching Row and Connect knit along right uh, tomorrow. It actually comes out as we speak. Obviously, when you're watching this, it might not be tomorrow, but we've got like free tasters in um, November, so you can join for free and just see what um, Row and Connects like and. You can find that all on our Knit Rowan and Rowan Connect sites and you find us all on the social media as well. And that's kind of what you're talking about. So there's lots of um, knit along groups and things on there that we do. And the great thing about that is actually that community because we just host the group. A lot of that activity is the community talking to each other. Right. So just at the moment, there's a we've got this blanket and somebody's come on and said, oh, this is my first time doing colour work. Do you think I'll be able to manage it? And then this swell of people joined and said, of course you will. I will help you if you get stuck. I can talk you through. We can have our own private Zooms if it gets really tricky. You know, and this just this knit community can be such a lovely place to be right. when they just swell behind and kind of support somebody. And I just love this passing on of knowledge. I think that's such a big gift to give people because it's it's free to give. But it's great oh, to And Rowan is also does a lot of um, classes that, that you mm. and you teach like different yeah. techniques and different yeah. you know, work on different projects. So that's like also one of the things that you can do on Rowan Connect. Yeah, Rowan Connect. We have weekends and classes and um videos that you can watch afterwards as well. But we have teachers from all over the world that are expert in their field. They really know what they're doing. And it's obviously great that because you can have like the camera like we're talking now but then you have a camera overhead so you get a really good shot of the 
hands and it's actually showing you how it's knitted as if it was your own hands right. because before previously what used to happen on youtube is people were learning to knit the wrong way around because the filming <laughs> was the other way around so now it's massive so yeah if you if you if you want to interact and find out about knitting go on to the rowan connect platform and you'll you there's loads in there to find out about and actually another good spot to register yourself is the newsletter because you yeah. I signed up for the newsletter just to see what it was. And I immediately got a free pattern in my mailbox and some discount offer for this, the yarn, you know, that that <laughs> pattern used. So like, I love that, you know? Right. Yeah. We talk, we give out a lot of information through our newsletter. We have a whole team that just talks out and gives you <clears throat> a little sneak peek of our, um, our new season, our new yarns, our new colorways and our new designs. We also highlight our retailers because um, we are nothing without the retailers. You can contact, you contact, be in contact with us digitally on Rowan Connect, as we said. But if you've got a local stand, yarn store near you, get out and use them. Use them or lose them, guys. This is the time that you really need to be there and um, interacting. And most yarn stores are just fantastic. They give you all the advice you need about color, about reworking it. Um, and, and they will support you in a knit project too, you know. Um, and they're great little communities usually. Well, before I let you go, can you share any other secrets about the yarns that's coming our way, maybe? <laughs> well, we've got <laughs> a lot gonna of... Tell. We're not going to yeah. tell. We're going to keep that secret. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got a lot of exciting things coming. We've got a lot of exciting new yarns coming. I can't tell you any more than that because literally it, when I'm talking about new, I mean next year. We are about to launch our autumn winter, which has got the felt of tweed in it. Big little sneaky sneak peek for you is this one here is actually will be on the front cover of the next main magazine. Um, and it's called um Sumac. And this and that is uh, Martin Story Design. This one here is Erica Knight, and that is Canyon, and that is that is in the in the next main magazine as well. And that's that whole story f supports felted tweed because it's our best loved yarn. Right. So I think that I'm trying to think if there's any other secrets I can give you. <laughs> no, well, that's it. I'm not going to say anymore. Okay. Well, if you change your <laughs> mind, you know how to find me and I'll keep it for you, I promise. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much, David. I really enjoyed having you on my channel and getting no a little problem. glimpse into the working so far. And, and we're going to continue with this series and talk to yeah. people. Yeah, you're going to talk to people throughout Rowan and throughout the team. So you're going to get an exclusive little look behind the curtain that is Rowan. And I have to say, that hour that we've chatted, or however long it is, has gone really fast because you've asked really interesting questions that have made me talk and made me think. So thank you very much for that. Because it's difficult to talk sometimes unless you're led. So right. I'm <laughs> really glad that you enjoyed that. And um, yeah, I, it was lovely. I had a lot Great of fun talking to you. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you. I hope you love this interview. It was so fascinating to learn how Rowan creates new yarns and all the little things that David shared with us today. My next guest is going to be Rowan designer, Georgia Farrell. And I hope you're going to tune in for that interview. Thank you for watching it. And until next time, happy crafting. <laughs>